Do not buy this. So audio companies are masters at marketing their products to you as the cure-all magic potion that's gonna be able to take your recordings to the next level, that is the secret sauce that's missing from your song. And while all of that does have a place for the creation process, I wanna dive into four things that I would recommend you avoid when it comes to your home studio setup, especially if you're just starting out. And I can already hear the gear sluts foaming at the mouth to disagree with the things I'm about to say. But please remember that this is a video towards artists who are looking to create and get as much bang for the buck as possible. And that's why I'm steering away from all of these things. The first thing is outboard gear. And if you aren't familiar with what that is, that's when you're in one of those big fancy studios and you see the wall that has tons of different knobs and you can send signal out from the computer over to that piece of equipment and then back into the computer. And what I wanna to say too is that it definitely is valuable in the right circumstance because it offers different sonic characteristics and different options for your raw recordings. But for me, when I look at what an artist needs to be able to create and to get the 80-20 best bang for the buck, you can buy this, which is a distressor compressor, which is $1,400 brand new. It's a fantastic piece of gear and definitely has its place, but if you're just starting out in the home recording world, looking to get your bearings and looking to create, you're better off taking that $1,400 or $1,000 if you're getting it used and getting lighting, a camera, investing in business courses, or even just paying your bills to keep yourself going in a much more practical sense than buying that one piece of equipment. Because at the end of the day, you're not gonna end up getting more opportunities because you have this analog distressor compressor, as opposed to overall having good looking and good sounding content that you're presenting. And again, there is the time and place for equipment like that, but that is so far down the line and so much money to be investing into something that is gonna make a minute difference. The second thing is very high-end speakers or monitors. I'm looking at this from a super practical standpoint. And the reality is that a lot of people, they're here working in bedrooms out of their living room in very suboptimal places for proper acoustics. And if you're in a kind of place like a bedroom with parallel walls and a lot of untreated surfaces, so the sound and the EQ curve of your room is gonna be very unbalanced. So at the end of the day, you might be paying $2,000 for speakers, but in the end, the signal's gonna be super, super muddy and you're not gonna get the full advantage of the clarity of that speaker. So I'd recommend save that for down the line it's more important to treat the space you're in first. Get the nicer monitors down the line. It's more important to focus on other aspects like acoustic treatment, which we will cover in number four. Number three is an excessive amount of plugins. And I understand because in the world of software, there are so many companies doing extremely similar things and it can be very overwhelming, daunting, and you're getting so much different advice from every single different outlet. But when it comes down to it, you only need a small handful of plugins. And I know for myself and so many other people, you end up sticking with about 10% or even less of the plugins that you ever purchase for your use every single day and every single week. So I would really urge you to think about, especially when it comes to plugins, because it's so easy to make an impulse purchase with software, to think, how is this going to factor into my daily or weekly use? Because at the end of the day, I have over 50 compressors sitting in my Pro Tools rig right now, and I use three of them. So there's no need to spend that kind of money. <laughs> and I see Steven laughing because it's so true. Like, yeah, there's maybe two or three, and then like there's one that gets used like every 10th mix because it's nothing else worked. But besides that, you're using the same stuff to just get a couple of basic things. And remember that the stock plugins are also incredibly useful and have a ton of value up front. And if you can learn to use that, it's gonna save you a lot of money down the line. And it's also important to remember that the stock plugins don't have everything. So if there are plugins that do offer something incredibly unique to your workflow, then definitely get it. it I'm not anti-plugin, I'm just anti-excess with it because it's a rabbit hole that so many people go down and use the fact that they can't afford the $3,000 Waves bundle for the fact that their music doesn't sound good, but you don't need that. It can be incredibly, incredibly simple and straightforward just by getting a few things. At the end of the day, it's being honest about what is this really going to bring to your creative life. It is super easy to get wrapped up in the marketing, in the promotion, in a testimony from somebody you might admire about how good this product is, but you have to think about for your own situation, and this is when the self-awareness is super important. For my own situation, what value does this add to my workflow? Is this gonna make me work faster every day? Is it going to be a whole new world of sounds that I don't have access to currently? Is this going to be a utility plugin that I'm using every single day? Those kinds of things, that's what I look at because I can say I probably have maybe seven or eight different things that I've purchased that I've never even finished downloading or never even opened because I just haven't had the time and I know what tools I use every single day. 
and I stick with them. Number four is pre-made or expensive acoustic panels. And I wanna be clear about the fact that I am a big advocate for acoustic treatment and it's a very sensical thing to do. And you can see from my studio here that I of course have treatment for myself to make sure I have a balanced space. But what I would recommend if you're an artist who's just looking to get into it is to not go and buy these things from companies. Because if you do that, they are of course going to mark it up in a massive way. And it's not that difficult to make effective home treatment yourself. And again, I don't hate on these companies for needing to make a profit and having a margin, but if we're looking at keeping the cost as low as possible, I'd recommend you take a look at Corey Batista's DIY guide for acoustic panels here, and take the time to learn how to make it yourself because it will pay off massively down the line. And an additional note here is I'm definitely not a fan and nor really should anybody be of a ton of acoustic foam. I'd recommend that you get some studio blankets instead. Those will definitely get you a decent way. It's not gonna replace what good acoustic paneling can do. But again, if we're looking at the just minimum price, what can you get done? Start with the studio blanket. So that's what I wanna look at, that massive ROI, as much return as you can get for a few dollars. And that's why I recommend you don't invest in those things yet. Down the line, if you're getting more serious about the recording world, that's a different conversation. But artists, you're looking to create, you're looking to do that with as little friction as possible for as few dollars. And that's why I say avoid these four things. So thank you so much for checking out this video. This is the follow-up video to the best budget home studio setup for artists that I made a couple weeks ago because it's the other side of the coin, making sure you don't fall into any kind of traps. So if you haven't seen that yet, make sure to go watch that somewhere. And other than that, make sure to subscribe, like the video. I'll see you in that next one. Peace.